Thank you very much <coughs> for the introduction and uh, to all the organizers for uh, setting up this meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in CIRM. So today I will talk about transition times. So this will be a talk about um, algorithms to estimate the time it takes for a stochastic process to go from one region to another one. And more precisely, we will be interested in situations where it's very difficult to simulate directly this time because it would require a lot of iterations to actually see the event, the transition events between the two sets we are interested in. So you need to do tricks in order to, to do that. So I will try to explain the tricks uh, which are behind that. Uh, the trick is called the Hill relation. So roughly speaking, the Hill relation will replace a long time computation by the evaluation of a small probability. And then the question is, uh, will be why is it easier to estimate a small probability than to simulate something over a very long time? And the answer is that you have algorithms to simulate rare events. Okay? And so I will present an algorithm which is called a splitting algorithm, which is one in the big family uh, of uh, rare event simulation techniques, one type of technique, uh, which is useful to simulate rare events. Okay? So this is the, the program. Uh, of this talk. Um, so let me start by setting up uh, the problem. So you have an, a, a stochastic, say, continuous in time process, xt, which lives in Rd. So this is a picture in dimension two, where the process, uh, uh, you know, uh, wanders around in this, in this plane. And you assume that it is ergodic, and you have two subsets which have a, a non-zero probability measure or the target measure or the equilibrium measure, which means that the process will necessarily visit these two sets infinitely often. Okay? So in other words, the, the process coming from B, so this is a dashed line here, this is coming from B, will go in A, made, made some loops around A, and then go in B, then spend some time uh, around before going back to A, etc., etc. Okay. So, what we are interested in are the blue parts of these trajectories. Okay. What I uh, so these blue parts are called the transition path. Okay. The transition path are those paths which, coming from B, enters A. Okay. So then you, if you want, you switch on your uh, your timer. And then you switch off the timer when you go into B. Okay? And this will give, you, this will give the, uh, what, what is the transition time, which is the length of this transition trajectory. Okay? Um, and since it will do this many, many times, you can do averages of a path over this path. Okay? And this is what I call equilibrium. Okay? So it means that you will do that many, many times. So you will see many of these blue paths, and you will do averages over that. Or typically, the focus of this talk will be the time it takes to go from A to B, so the length of these blue parts. Okay? But you can imagine all the things you would be interested in. Okay? Um, so what are the, the, what are the stochastic processes we, are, uh, we have in mind? It could be anything, okay? in some sense, as soon as it is Markovian. But uh, to, to, to be more precise, you can think, for example, and to keep things simple, you can think, for example, uh, uh, you can have in mind this, this dynamic, which is called the overdump Langevin dynamics, where you have a process xt in Rn, so n was equal to 2 in the previous slide. Then you have a potential v from Rn to R, and you take the gradient of this potential. So you have here a simple steepest descent, if you want, um, dynamics that you perturb with some noise. So here you have a Brownian motion on a square root of 2 beta minus 1. So beta minus 1, from a physical point of view, is proportional to the temperature of your system. So the smaller the temperature, the smaller the noise. Okay? And so this is just the, the, just the noise that you have on your system. Okay? So over a time step of size delta t, when you are at a point xn, what you do is that you first add to xn a minus grade v of xn delta t. And then you add, in addition to that, a square root of 2 beta minus 1 delta t times a Gaussian. Okay? That's a, that you have a, 
in, in dimension n, the Gaussian. Okay? So that's, the, that's the, the dynamics that you have in mind. And so why is this problem difficult? It's because typically A, uh, in, in, in applications I have in mind, which are indeed molecular dynamics, as mentioned by Virginie, so these conformations A on B are conformations in which the system stays for a very long time because it, it corresponds to almost stable conformation. Okay? So think of uh, local minima of V. Okay? So it means that A is what we call metastable. So it means that the transition from A to B are actually rare events, and the transition time from A to B is very large. So it would take ages to simulate directly you know, the transition time from A to B. So the, the question we, have, we ask is how to do that efficiently numerically without naively discretizing my dynamics and just you know, following the dynamics over large time. Okay? So the fact that I is metastable has actually two uh, implies two difficulties. The first one is that, as I mentioned, the time we would like to compute is very large. And second, it's also very difficult to reach equilibrium. Because to reach equilibrium, you will need to do many, many times, not only once, but many, many times these back and forth uh, 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 motions between the, the, the states A and B. So that's... Uh... Okay, so is, is the question clear? Is it... Is it um, please ask questions if it's not. So the first step to do that, uh, will be to introduce some uh, co-dimension one manifold sigma that you will determine okay, as a level set of some function, typically, okay, from Rn to R. And uh, think of a distance to A, for example. This would be, this would be a, a circle around A. Okay? And what you do is that you, you, you say that the process that you are considering, when it enters A, it goes to sigma at some point, and when it's, once it's on sigma, it goes either back to A or to B. Okay? So here what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm discretizing, if you want, in, in, in time, uh, the problem by introducing a, 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 a Markov chain Yn, which is a sequence of successive intersections of my process Xt with the boundary of A union the boundary of B, and what you do is that you, if yn is here, yn plus 1 is here. Okay? So it means that you have to, in between uh, intersections with, a, uh, with the boundary of A and boundary of B, you require to hit sigma in between. Okay? So I hope this is clear. So if, so you see, so if yn is here, yn plus 1 is there. This is a yn plus 2, etc., etc. And here you have a point which is on the boundary of A, you eat sigma in between, and then you go to B. Okay? So my process Yn is with, value, uh, with values in the boundary of A, union the boundary of B. Okay? And I denote that by the curly A and the curly B. Okay? So that's that notation. Yes? Uh, So the problem with the last time you lived A is that it's not a, a, a stopping time. So it means that uh, uh, um, you, you, you will, I mean, the fact here why N is just a, a Markov process, okay? Yeah. If I decide to, so this, uh, the quantity you, 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 you are mentioning will be of interest uh, though because uh, among this transition time, transition path, you have actually two parts of this transition path. You have all these loops from the boundary of A up to sigma back to the boundary of A, so basically what, which does nothing. So we do all these loops, okay? And finally, we succeed in, in the sense that we leave the boundary of A, go to sigma, and actually go to B before going back to A, okay? And here, the last time we leave A is exactly what you are mentioning. So it, this, this quantity will appear in, in, in the following, okay? And since you ask about that, I can now introduce the, the, a name. So I call the blue part uh, the transition path, and I will call the, 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 what uh, Olivier is referring to, so this last part of the transition path is called the reactive path. Okay? It's only the part of the transition path which does the transition from A to B. Okay? And going back to AMD, to molecular dynamics, it's interesting to look at this in particular because it gives you what is called the molecular mechanism or the transition mechanisms. In other words, the path that the process uh, follows to indeed go from A to B, okay? 
and, and, and you can imagine all the applications this may have if you want to control this uh, to enhance heat or, or, or on the contrary to actually avoid it. Okay, so that's, that's a... Okay, so this is, so in the following, I will in some sense forget XT very quick, very quickly, very soon, and I will only focus on this YN. So you really need to, and in some sense, you can from the very beginning consider that you have only a YN, okay, which is uh, from uh, in, in believing in some curly A union curly B, and it takes a lot of time to actually leave curly A, okay? But that would be also the picture that we have from the very beginning. Okay, this is just a formalization of what I've said. You have the first heating time after tau n minus one of sigma, and tau n is the first heating time of A union B after tau n sigma, okay? Just to write things. Uh, and again, this is a Markov chain, and you can write the kernel of it, I mean, explicitly, okay? Uh, in terms of the uh, transition uh, probability of the original process XT. Okay. So that's, um, that's uh, my process. And now I can uh, recast the quantity I was interested in. So the transition times from A to B for XT, I can recast it in terms of YN, okay? So XT will be still in the two or three next slides, and after that it will disappear. I will explain how I, if I am able to sample efficiently YN, I will be able to compute my quantity of interest from the first side. And so how is this uh, going? So you take the successive times where you visit A and B, so you see how it is defined. So this is for Yn, the time. So now time is discrete, so the, you know, the, the time step, if you want, or the n, when Yn is in A after visiting B, and this is the same but going to B, right? And what you do is that you look at this quantity, which is uh, the successive, so you look at this guy, okay? It's the successive visits, uh, entry points in A coming from B. Okay, so you have your process, it goes in B, back in A, or in B, back in A, okay? So these are all the entrance points in A coming from B, okay? And I take uh, uh, all these points, I make an ergodic average, I send k to infinity, and this defines what is called the reactive entrance distribution in A at equilibrium. I will say reactive entrance in the following, okay? So this quantity is, I coming from B, I go to A, okay? I, I, I wait for the next visit to B, I'm coming back, back to A again, okay? And so, I mean, intuitively, you understand that this quantity is important because this, this describes the equilibrium. So it holds the entry points in A at equilibrium. And so what I would like to do is, starting from this distribution, how long does it take to go to B? Okay, that's the question I would like to, to address. And this is what is written in the next slide. The quantity, you can show by using a strong Markov property, that the quantity you're interested in is the expectation, starting from this equilibrium distribution, okay, of the sum from zero to the first time you will visit B indeed, of delta of yn. And delta of yn is nothing but the expectation of tau 1. So of the time it takes for the original process xt, either to do a loop if uh, yn plus 1 is in A, in the boundary of, of A, okay? So this is the average time of a loop, or the length of the reactive path, okay? If yn plus 1 is actually in B, okay? So at the end of the day, this is what we would like to compute. Okay, so maybe I can write it on the blackboard so that everybody's uh, keep in mind the quantity of interest. Uh, I can probably put it there. So the quantity of interest, the mean transition time from A to B, can be written as the expectation from new E of a sum from n is equal to zero to Tb minus one of uh, some function delta of yn. And in some sense, I mean, if, if, you have a, uh, if you have forgotten some details of, the, of the, this first part, you can you know, start from that, okay? I have a Markov chain yn, I have a function delta, okay? This yn lives in A union B, okay? It takes a lot of time to go from A to B, so Tb will be typically very large, okay? And new E is some equilibrium distribution on the boundary of A, okay? And you would like to compute that, okay? And why is it difficult, again? For two reasons, because it's difficult to sample new E, it's an equilibrium 
probability, so you would need to wait for a lot of time to see many entries in A coming from B. And second, this is very large. Okay, so you will need to, to simulate your process over very large times to actually uh, um, you know, uh, uh, simulate this quantity. Okay? Is it clear? So there will be no XT anymore in the following, okay? Uh, this will be the quantity of interest. Yep. The choice of the um, um, uh, surface there of co-dimension one, yep. um, is it, I mean, I guess it depends in that formula yeah, so. f on your choice there, because your, you define your yn depending, your definition of yn depends on the choice of this uh, manifold of co-dimension one. Uh, will your result eventually be independent of so that, or? this is true. I mean, this quantity does not depend on sigma. I mean, it was a transition time for xt from A to B. I don't need sigma there. So here, yes. sigma appears indeed there everywhere, OK? Uh -huh. But uh, I mean, what you are going to is that it's a numerical parameter, OK? It's a numerical so parameter. So okay. in some sense, I will need, I mean, at the end of the day, going back to xt, uh, I would need to uh, optimize over sigma in order, for example, to make the variance of the estimator associated to this the smallest possible. Okay. Ah, okay. So, but okay. You, eventually you, but you are yeah. independent, but uh, this is uh, yeah. going to be in the numerical. So it will be a numerical parameter to, okay. to be, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thanks. I will not discuss a lot that because uh, I, I will really focus on uh, basic things on that. But. Okay, so what will be, okay, so this, this is what I've just said. So the two challenges are TB is very large and new is difficult to sample. So as I, say, as I said in the introduction, there will be two ingredients in this story, one which is the so-called Hill relation, which will replace this long time sum, I mean, this large sum by the computation of a rare event, okay, the priority of a rare event, sorry. And second, an algorithm to actually sample a, a, a rare event and compute its probability, okay? That will be the two ingredients in, in, this, uh, in this story. So let me uh, go in, uh, to the first ingredient, which is uh, the, the Hill relation, okay? So this is a slide for probabilist guys in the room, uh, which are what we need on YN to, for, for everything to be well defined. So you need basically an ergodic process and some regularity. So there is failure regularity and some ergodicity. I guess uh, I will not go into the details of that uh, at the moment. Um, okay, so that, 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 let's, let's, so what is the Hill relation? So the Hill relation, the basic idea of the Hill relation is the following, and it go back, go back to Kramers, who, who is a, a chemist or physicist who, who worked about, I mean, how to, 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 to understand these transition times, even, I mean, from an experimental, experimental point of view, too. And one idea which is uh, very nice is, is to say, so it takes a lot of time to, to go from A to B, and it's a complicated uh, problem. So let me do the following. I will put a sink in B. So it means that when the process will go in B, it will disappear into a sink, okay? And it will reappear in A. Okay, so I will create like that a, a flux from A to B, artificial flux, okay, in some sense. Okay, I, I start in A, each time I go in B, buff, I go back to A directly, okay? So I, 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 I create a flux, okay? And what I need to actually estimate is the flux from A to B on this new process, okay? To estimate the... Uh, Transition time I had at the beginning, okay? So of course, when I'm saying that, uh, this will not be correct, whatever the way I re-inject the process in A, okay? I need to, to, to make things consistent in order to not to create some, some error in that process, okay? But this source sync idea is uh, the basis of many algorithms in practice. And what we, would like, what we did with, uh, I should have mentioned that this is a joint work with Manon Baudel, and Arnaud Guyader, what we did with Manon and Arnaud is to try to understand these very basic questions, which is uh, how should you re-inject the process in A in order not to bias, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the quantity you would like to estimate, okay? So how to re-inject it? Okay? That's the, the part of the question. So what I've just described is called a, a, a P-return process. So I, what I call YNP, so this little, uh, here, 
is what, or pi maybe, this, written, this pi here, is, is the probability with, with which uh, you re-inject the process when you, go, when you are in B and BAF, you go back to A. Okay? So this is a probability measure on A only, okay? on curly A only. And what you do, so this is a, the, the, the transition probability, but in words, uh, what you do is that you take your, chain, your original chain YN, and each time it goes to B, actually you say, no, it's not in B. It's back in A, uh, independently from the past, okay? with a probability that I fix, which is called pi. Okay, is it clear? So this process will have an equilibrium probability that I call R of pi. Okay, so R of pi is, is just the equilibrium probability of this new process. Okay, so this is really the sink source idea. And I take this over a very long time, okay. I hope that it will reach equilibrium quicker than the original one in some sense, okay. And I, it will have some stationary state, R of pi. Okay, is it clear? Right? So you can write formulas for this R of pi as a function of the process of the, of the sorry, transition, uh, the transition kernel of the chain 1A, uh, Yn, but uh, uh, these are details. So just to, to, just to, to say that this idea of, you know, this sourcing idea goes back to Kramer's. And I, I've also, I also seen people mentioning Farkas uh, even before. And it's the basis of many techniques. So here are a few names of techniques that, can, that are based on this idea. Okay, just to... Tony, at this point, pi could be uh, whatever uh, probability measure on yeah. A, and I guess afterwards you'll say which one should yeah. be taken we from... we will play with pi, okay? In particular, there will be good pies and bad guys. <laughs> so good pies in terms of uh, do you do with this, and by measuring the flux of this, um, can you actu actually approximate that? Okay, that will be the typical. Okay, so let's, do, let's, let's now go to that. Um, I think I'm a little bit too fast here. Alors, voilà. Um, so take, for example, for any pi, this process, okay? You live in A, each time it goes in B, paf, back to pi, okay? And imagine that I am interested in expectation of pi of this quantity. So this is exactly that, except that I have a pi here and not a new E, okay? Huh? So imagine that I'm interested in that, and f is any function. So it would be the delta that I mentioned before, but, okay? And you have this nice relation, which tells you that the expectation of pi of this long, large sum is just a, a ratio, okay? So in the numerator, you have the average of f respect to the equilibrium uh, probability of my process, okay? And in the denominator, this is a small probability I was mentioning from the beginning. So in the denominator, what do you have? You start with a y naught, which is distributed according uh, to r of pi, and you ask yourself the question, is y one, over one time step, is y one in b or not, okay? So here you are looking at the following probability, starting from r of pi, okay? What is the probability to go to b directly, okay, in one step? So of course, this will be a very small probability if you think about my original process and all the story before where a was metastable. Most of the time, when you start from a point in a, you go back to a, you don't go to b, okay? So, but, so here, if you want, you have replaced the uh, long time computation, okay, by uh, 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 the sampling of or the evaluation of a very small probability problem. Okay, does it uh, make sense? So, of course, what should be pi? We know what should be pi. Pi should be new e, okay? And so there is a natural question, which is if I take pi is equal to new e, what is r of pi? So, what is r of new e? What is the equilibrium probability of the new E return process, okay? When each time I go back, I am in B, I re-inject in A according to new E, that I don't know, huh? so it's, uh, okay? But theoretically, you can check that R of new E is actually not that complicated. It's just the equilibrium distribution of Yn restricted to A, okay? So this is already interesting because you have, you, you see, you have what you wanted to compute, which is replaced by something which is rather explicit, 
which involve this small probability in the denominator, and which requires to sample P0 restricted to A. And that's the problem with this. It's because you don't know the equilibrium distribution in general, let's say. You don't know the, the equilibrium distribution of Yn because of the sigma. Okay? Maybe, you don't, maybe you knew the equilibrium distribution of Xt, the original process in the background, but for Yn, as soon as you introduce this sigma, you have introduced some you know, complicated process, and you don't have, in general, a direct access to P0A. Okay? But let us assume for one second that you know how to sample with P0A. Okay? So what would you do? You would take many, many IID samples, independent and identically distributed samples, with respect to pi not a, and you will do an empirical average to estimate the numerator. This is on the one hand, okay? And on the other hand, taking all these IID samples, you will ask yourselves, what is the probability to be in B, in a, to go to B in one step, okay? So this is a difficult part, actually, because if you do it naively by just taking these initial conditions and doing one time, <laughs> uh, one time step and checking if you are in B, most of the time the answer will be no. Okay? And so you will get an estimate of the denominator, which is just zero. So you will have to do something clever to estimate this small probability. But that's the only remaining problem okay? that I will address in the following. Okay? So this is what I explained here. Um, if you look at, uh, at this, I mean, if you look at this formula, uh, and if you go back to the situation where f was the delta, as I was mentioning before, so which was either the loop, the, 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 the length of the loop, or the length of a reactive path, you can rewrite everything explicitly. I mean, you have a formula which is here fully explicit um, to estimate this quantity depending on the average time of a loop. Okay, uh, the probability to go to B in one step, and the average time of, of the average length, if you want, of the reactive path, I mean the last part of the transition. Okay, that's a fully explicit formula. And if I give you a way to estimate the probability and to sample the P dot A, I guess you have understood how to, 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 to estimate all these three guys, right? Um, okay, so this is where we are now. And again, the difficulty is that P0, on, in particular P0 restricted to A, the, the conditional probability of P0 being, being knowing that you are in A, they are in general unknown and not that easy to sample. So the, 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 the practical algorithm that people use in practice is to replace this P0 this, uh, with, yeah, this P0 or this new A, if you want, by something easier, okay? And here again, I think things are quite natural. So if you think about the question I had at the beginning, using the metastability of A, the metastability helps you in some sense, because you have A, you have B, and you have sigma. And what I told you is that you will do many, many loops before finally, you know, succeeding in and, 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 and you're going to be, okay? But, so, if you do many, many loops, the way you entered A coming from B, so, in other words, the fact that here the initial point is distributed according to new A, new E, the reactive entrance, is not that important, because you will quickly forget this and reach some kind of equilibrium you know, uh, local equilibrium in A before actually going to B. Okay, does it make sense what I'm saying? So it's, it's quite hand-waving, but this is, uh, at the moment, but this is, what I, this is the idea. You will have some uh, uh, local equilibrium in A before going to B, and this local equilibrium will not depend on the way you entered A. Okay, and so you can replace the new he here by this guy, and this guy will be easier to sample because he's just go doing loops. So at the end of the day, I will do some loops, okay, from A to sigma back to A. That will be easy. I will, this will give me some initial distribution, which is not new E, but not far from what is actually needed. I will compute the average time of these loops, okay, and then I still need this, this uh, splitting algorithm to estimate the probability. Okay, that will be the, the, the but that's the way. Yes. Uh. 
first small question. Uh, do you have, uh, will you better take sigma close to A or far from A? Uh, so there is a balance between the two, okay? Okay. So if sigma gets very close to A, okay, going back maybe to this mm -hmm. formula to be uh, more precise. So if you go very, very close to A, yeah. the probability becomes very, very small. Okay. Okay. But on the other hand, the numerator, the size of the loops will also get smaller. So there is no inconsistency when I'm saying I have a over B, B is going to zero, A also. <laughs> so the, the delta rack but of course go. you can imagine that from a numerical point of view in terms of variances, mm -hmm. the smaller the probability, the more difficult it will be to ex actually estimate it. Okay? Yeah. On the other hand, if sigma is very far away from A, the probability gets larger, yes. very nice. But then it actually get, <laughs> becomes very difficult to go from A to sigma and then back to A. So it becomes difficult to just estimate, for example, something as simple as the size of such a loop. Uh, okay? Yeah. So there is, a, there is a trade-off to find in between, I mean, yes. between, between these, two, these two regimes, uh, which will not only depend on the bias of the estimator, but also on the variance. Okay? And, and this is something we're actually investigating now. I will mostly talk about, bi about biases here. So in other words, for example, what is the error I'm doing by replacing new E here by, uh, by, by the, the quasi-stationary distribution I was mentioning, so this local equilibrium, okay? So this is a bias. But I will not talk about you know, variances, which is, of course, a big part of the theory. And could that help to define something that we could called a neighborhood of A, in which most loops are. And is it, no, would I that mean, be interesting? And what you, would be your criterion for that? No, no, but I mean, in practice, this is the way we do it. I mean, so we don't define sigma and then look at if it's good or not. We actually simulate the process. It goes around A, and then we say, OK, where to put sigma? <laughs> OK, uh, ah, maybe uh, here it's, it's, re it's reasonable because, I mean, in a, in a given computational time, I have sufficiently many samples, and I have a reasonable a a approximation of this guy, which is this, this, this you know, average time of a loop. Okay, so that's, in practice, it is done the way you've, you, you are. And uh, neighbors, the probability of uh, sigma but I mean, if you do, uh, uh, if you do, I mean, if, if you want this, this for me to be to be greater than one half, you will need to put sigma very far away from A, and it will be very difficult to actually. That's a. Okay, so that was um, where we were standing, and so let me introduce this. Um, local equilibrium I was mentioning before. So I told you, I mean, I will forget the way I enter A. I will reach a residual equilibrium before going to B, OK? So if you want to formalize that mathematically, you can do it by using the notion of quasi-stationary distribution. So you know what is a stationary distribution? It's for my process YN for the beginning, for example. I take it over, over a very large trajectory, and I, and I do an, an empirical average over it. It will converge to some probability, which is a stationary probability. What is the quasi-stationary distribution? It's something quite similar, except that you don't want to go to B. So you look at your process, but you condition it to not having visiting B up starting from the beginning. So here you see what I'm doing. I look, uh, not, not here, not here, here. I look at my process YN, conditioned to the fact that the uh, time to reach B is larger than N. So in words, I'm looking at my process at time N, Condition to the fact that from 0 to n, I stayed in A. I start in A here. Why not is in A? Okay. And I send n to infinity. And this will go to a QSD. Okay. This is one way to see a QSD, which is exactly what I've done with hands here. Another way to do it is to actually define it using uh, a, a, like a fixed point procedure. So a stationary state is a, a, a fixed point of my transition probability. Okay, and in, in, uh, like, uh, in, in the same way, a QSD is a fixed point of my transition probability, but condition not to leave A. Okay, so this is what is written here. I start from new Q. I ask what is the probability, what is the law of Y1 condition to the fact that I'm still in A at time one. Okay, but it's still new Q. Okay, that's the QSD, right? 
And what is nice is that if you think about it one minute, I guess you will, you can, you will realize that if I take the new Q return process, the equilibrium density of the new Q return process is exactly R, is exactly new Q. Because, I mean, if you think about my new Q return process, what does it do? It starts with new Q, say, okay, because it comes from B, okay? And it stays in A, but if it stays in A, it's still on the new Q. And then at some point it goes in B, but when it goes in B, it is immediately re-injected in A according to new Q. So of course, you are always, if you start at new Q, you are always at new Q at every time step, okay? At every end. So new Q is a fixed point of the R map, okay? If I start on the new Q, the new Q return process remains on the new Q, right? And it means that if I plug that in my hill relation I had before, remember I have an expectation of pi, and here I had R of pi, but R of pi is not just new Q, okay? And now I have a full algorithm, I mean, a fully implementable algorithms as soon as I know how to compute this probability, okay? So that's, that's, that's what people are doing at the end of the day. I mean, uh, in many algorithms, they actually are using that. Okay, and that's, and actually they are even using some uh, even uh, less uh, easier version of that, which is that this is in, in general typically completely negligible compared to this part, so you can forget about that. The minus one, if you think of one over 10 to the minus 10, uh, you can forget about it, okay? So at the end of the day, you have just a, a ratio, which is one over the probability, which is the number of loops that you will do, times the average time of a loop. So just to say it again, the time it takes to go from A to B is what? It's the number of loops I'm doing. Number of loops will be basically one over the probability to reach B after touching sigma times the average time of a loop, which is not, I mean, you can guess the formula is not completely crazy, okay? Okay, my time is, I'm running out of time, so, uh, you can check that, what I've said, uh, you can check that um, if I replace the original quantity that I'm interested in by the quantity where I replace new E by new Q, the QSD, you can check that it's small if A is metastable. It's intuitive and you can do the math, okay? It's, it's the math part of the paper. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm just forgetting maybe the, the part on which we've worked the most, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the, which took us the, the most uh, of time, but let me, uh, let me skip that in order to, to directly go to uh, the last part of uh, what I wanted to present, which is how to estimate not the, 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 the probability, the small probability, okay? And I will stop after that, okay? So five minutes just to present the idea of the algorithm, okay? So here you can, if you want, forget everything. I mean, you can go back if you are lost, okay? Uh, the question is the following now, and it's a question which is of its own interest. I give you some probability nu over uh, uh, the boundary of A, typically, okay? And I would like to look at the probability that you reach B before A. So maybe nu is on sigma, let's say. So nu is on sigma, okay. So it's uh, to go to, to make a link with that. It's, you, you have the QSD on A, and this will, 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 trans, this will be transported to a probability over sigma, okay. So you attack on this probability over sigma, okay. So it's a new sigma, say. And you ask yourself, what is the probability that I do not go back to A, but I go to B before going back to A? This is a very small probability. And the question is how to do, to estimate that guy, okay? That's, this is what I will explain now. So when you do rare events, algorithms, when you, do, when you want to compute rare events, you have basically two big families of algorithms. You have important sampling algorithms and you have splitting algorithms, okay? So here I will explain what are splitting algorithms. A splitting algorithm is that, is the idea is that you have a very small probability event, but you can, uh, if you want, um, uh, create a nested sequence of events which will be larger and larger in terms of probability and in terms of inclusion, okay? So that at some point, this becomes a, a nice uh, event in the sense that you can, so its probability is large, one half, okay? So you can just use a naive algorithm, Monte Carlo algorithm to estimate it. And then the problem is to go 
to the all these nested sequence to go through all of them by conditional probability. So you have the probability of the largest event, okay? And then you have to compute the probability of the next one conditionally to be in the largest, and then of the next one conditionally to be in the, in the second, etc. Et okay, this is the idea. So the idea is that it will be easier to compute n times a probability of one half rather than directly the probability one half to the n. Okay, so it's like a divide and conquer idea. Okay, so you, 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 you will compute n times one half and you will do one half times one half times one half rather than one half to the n directly. Okay, that's the idea of splitting. So how to make that, you know, how to make this uh, in practice in this specific context? This is what I will explain quickly. So you have the first time you enter in A, the first time you enter in B, and you would like to look at the event I reach A before B, okay? Starting from a point on sigma, say, okay? So I reach, ah, sorry. Uh, c'est marrant, ça. Ouais, ouais, bah là, il y a une faute qui est là depuis euh, cinq ans. Donc, uh, <laughs> B before A, okay? Uh, I would like to, I'm reaching in this event, reaching B before A, okay? That, uh, so, reaching B before A is a very small probability event, which is here, okay? So I'm including it into a sequence of easiest, easier events, okay? So what are these easier events? Let me do a picture, which is easier than the formulas. The, uh, these events are the following. It's difficult to reach starting from a point here, B before A. But it's easier to reach something there, and even easier to reach something there before going to A. Jack, jack, you see the idea? So the, the, I define the sigma with a level set of some function in my, okay? Use the same function to actually define some intermediate milestones that you would like to reach, okay, before going to A. So if you take here a first milestone, I call it sigma Z1, okay, it will be, Maybe not that, e not that difficult to reach sigma z1 before going to A, okay? If you do it naively, you will have maybe failed attempts, but a few of them will actually do the job, right? So that's, uh, that's the, uh, how this, the basic idea of this. So here, to formalize a little bit what I'm saying, you have a tau z1, which is the first time I reach z1, and a tau z2, etc., up to a two z max, okay? And all these are, you know, containing the next one, okay? So it's a sequence of nested events. And so probability to reach B before A is this product. So first, the probability to reach actually sigma Z1 before going to A. Then knowing that the probability to reach Z2 before A. Then knowing that, blah, 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 okay? And then at the end of the day, the probability to reach actually B before A, knowing that you reach sigma Z max before A, okay? And so if sigma Z max is close to B, this will be basically one, okay? Okay, this is a, the splitting technique. So this was my one half, one half, one half, and this is the one half to the n, okay? So this is, this is called, uh, uh, so when you look at this, okay, and you ask where to put the intermediate milestones, and when you do, you do a small uh, variance analysis, you realize that the best way to do it is that you should have the same probability to reach the next one, given the, the okay, you should, equilibrate all these probabilities. Very nice, how to do that is not completely clear, but <laughs> that's the idea, okay? So you should choose the, 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 the sigma q's, okay? All these intermediate milestones so that all these probabilities are the same. Um, and so in practice, let's do it the other way around. Let's choose the probability and let's define the milestones so that this probability is always the same, okay? So in other words, I have a certain number of replicas, so now let me go to the, to the algorithm and I will stop that there. So you have a, 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 a this is a sigma, my, my, uh, you know, my initial milestone, okay? And these are initial points according to the QSD on this, okay, going back to the first part of the. What I do is that, so I have here three trajectories, but think of an algorithm where you will have 1,000 of trajectories, okay? I do the trajectories naively, okay? And I stop them when they reach either A or B. Here they stop in A. So these sigma ZQs are defined as level set of a function Xi, okay? 
and I would like to define the next milestone in such a way that I have exactly a probability, say, uh, two-thirds here to reach the next milestone. So what should I do? I should actually look at the maximum of Xi over all the path and take the black sheep, okay, the guy who actually went the less far in the Xi metric, uh, the less far from A, and just put the milestone exactly where this guy uh, actually reached the maximum of Xi. It's maximum of time, okay? So this will be my first milestone. So you understand that these are not, you know, probabilistic quantities. If I reduce the algorithm, I will get another milestone, okay? But it's, it's a natural idea, given the fact that I would like a small variance estimator, uh, what I've said before. And now the problem is that I have only, I killed this guy, and I have only two trajectories. So if, if I go on like that, I will have no trajectories anymore, okay? So I need to recreate a new trajectory Condition to the fact, think of the conditional probability, which is everywhere in this, uh, in this story. So here I need to do that, to sample a guy according to that. So I need to sample a guy, uh, a new trajectory, conditioned to the fact that it reached at least this first milestone before going to A. Okay? How I do that in practice? This is one way to do it. I choose one of the remaining trajectories at random, I copy the path up to this point, and then I finish using the Markov, the Markov chain that I, I have from the very beginning, the Markov process. And I go on like that, okay? This is the new black, bad guy, etc. And here you see the number of steps that you need in order to go to uh, this final milestone will be random, but the probability becomes constant. It will be two-thirds to uh, n, capital N, which will be the number of steps I need to go up to there, okay? And to make a long story short, you can show that this estimator I have just mentioned is unbiased. So whatever the choice of Xi, the way you define the level sets, whatever the choice of n, the total number of parameters that you have, it was three in my picture. Whatever the number of guys that you kill at each iteration, it was one, okay? So these are the three numerical parameters. Whatever these three guys, the expectation of my uh, est estimator is exactly the probability I, I am interested in, okay? So now you have your algorithms to compute the rare events, okay? You will do that on many uh, computers in parallel. You can play with the Xi. Uh, this will be a parameter which will be important in terms of variance, typically. And, and, and you will be able to uh, simulate this guy by just doing some, you know, empirical averages over all the risks. Okay, so that was the story. So just, uh, yeah, so we, we, we use this algorithm on, on, in many cases just to give a, one figure. So this is a small uh, uh, protein ligand system. So here you have a small, a small molecule which is in a, in, a, in a big protein. And you see that the molecule, uh, you can see three, three positions of the small molecules, in, in red, one in red, one in yellow, one in purple here. And you are interested in the way the ligand will leave the protein and how long it will take because the, effic the efficiency of a drug depends on its affinity to actually go into a, a, a site like that, but also on the time it takes to leave the site, okay? And so you, we, they were interested, and in, uh, this is a joint work with uh, people from uh, uh, the NAMD group of Klaus Schulten, so Ivan Theo and Chris Main in uh, Illinois, and uh, we were able to estimate this time uh, in a, with a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, error, uh, in a, a, a total computational time, which is four order of magnitude smaller than the computational time you would have needed uh, if, if you were to actually approximate this directly by, you know, naive uh, direct simulation. Okay, so that's uh, just a figure on a typical example. Um, why? Well, I think I will just, uh, so of course, you can imagine the number of questions that uh, are raised by all these techniques in terms of how to, uh, we started to discuss about how to uh, actually choose Xi here, choose Sigma in the first place, in the very first place, what is A, what is B, it's a nightmare, okay? So <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, to make this work in practice, uh, there are the ideas on the one hand and there is a way to implement the ideas on the other hand, okay? And these are a few papers I've mentioned. So this is the last one, which is really on, on, the, on this Hill relation, on the, how to compute the mean reaction time or the mean transition times. And uh, this one is about um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you have an unbiased estimator of the rare event probability by using this 
splitting technique. I thank you for your attention. Ouais. Yeah. No, no, so everything is moving, okay? So, uh, I mean, we are using these dynamics. I did not, uh, I did not uh, actually present a lot. I mean, we use this so-called Langevin dynamics, where you have, uh, on the one hand, the positions, it's QT, and PT are, are the, 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 the momenta. Uh, we have noise, so I, I heard deterministic. All what I've said, you know, uh, 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 is, is, is not working where you have deterministic trajectories. So I really need stochastic, stochastic trajectories. I, I do not take them. So, I mean, you, you can, I mean, in, in the potential V, the grad V, okay, uh, it means that you will, by these dynamics, you will not allow the system to visit high V regions because the minus grad V will always take you back to you know, uh, reasonable V regions. So in particular, when you have chemical bonds like covalent bonds, they are associated with pairwise interactions which are very stiff. So if you, st if you try to actually you know, tear apart the two, two atoms which are uh, cov covalently bonded uh, chemically, um, the potential D that you use will not allow for that because it, will, it would mean that the, the, you will have to visit regions of V with very large gradients on, on actually very large V. So this does not occur in practice because of the V. Okay? So, but, but this is an important question. I mean, so depending on the system, on the, on the problem you are interested in, uh, you have to choose a good V. Okay? So here, in what I've presented, you, you don't have chemical reactions. So you don't have, for example, covalent bonds breaking. Okay? You, you are not interested in that, and you don't want to see that. Okay? The difficult part is, for example, water. You have water around. Which, which model to use you know, for water is, is a big question. But you don't model chemical reactions. On the other hand, if you do cat cat catalysis, uh, you need a very good potential to actually describe the fact that it will, this will occur. Okay? And, uh, it will be actually the quantity, typically the quantity of, of interest, the, the chemical reaction. So, in other words, for your modeling question, everything is hidden in V. And choosing V is a big, you know, it's not a numerical parameter, it's a modeling parameter, which has, of course, a big influence on the result. And it, it's a story in itself to how to do that, that I cannot tell because I'm not a specialist of choosing the V. So. Yep. In time, um, so it's a question uh, which is difficult to answer because you would need to tell me what is the model you have in mind, uh, which depends on the dimension. So if you think of, if you think of my protein ligand problem, the dimension is fixed by my. You have a certain number of atoms; they all live in R three, so the dimension is R three. N, N being the number of atoms, full dot. Of course, I can add more and more water to keep things increasing, but it doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, on the other hand, your question makes sense if you decide that you, will, you are interested in, for example, a homogeneous you know, material with many times the same atoms or the same molecules, and you would like to do what is called a thermodynamic limit. So increase the number of atoms or molecules and keeping the density constant, and then the, your question uh, would make sense. And we did not, honestly, we did not analyze the thermodynamic limit of these algorithms 
so, so I have no good answer on, on, on this scaling. What we analyzed is the scaling, for example, of this small probability uh, estimation algorithm as a function of uh, the probability itself. So, in other words, when I have a probability of 10 to the minus 10 to estimate, I know that if I do naive Monte Carlo, I would need at least 10 to the 10 atoms, just to see one, you know. And, and, and here, the complexity is scales like the log, or minus, minus the log of the probability. Okay, so, so this is a very nice property because you, 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 yeah, you have a log. It's a, it's a, it's a classical divide and conquer. So it's, it's the only thing I, uh, it doesn't answer your question, but it goes, <laughs> it goes around. But it's a nice question. I have no, no answer on that. I mean, does it, uh, in other words, does it uh, circumvent the, the curse of dimensionality and these kind of things? I don't know. I mean, 